Hello and welcome back. So we're moving on to, we're starting to develop a method for checking arguments for validity, right? We have a method for checking arguments for invalidity, which is the counterexample method. Um, in order to be able to check arguments for validity, uh, we have to do a little work. It's gonna take a few lectures to get there. The first one is to understand the logic words in English, right? Because the key to checking arguments for validity is being able to focus in on specific words um, that have certain logical weight in uh, the English language and in all <clears throat> natural languages, typically. These are called logical connectives or statement operators. I think in the text they call them statement operators, but um, some people also call them logical connectives. So before we get to those, uh, the first distinction to understand is between two types of statements. Now recall we said the statements are a special kind of sentences, right, in English. So not all sentences are statements, right? Uh, questions aren't statements, at least in our terminology, right? Commands aren't statements. Statements are the types of things that can be true or false, right? So the sky is blue, or even things like, um, you know, uh, the Beatles are the best band in the world. Uh, even if you think, well, that's a matter of opinion, uh, it's the sort of thing that it makes sense to say, oh, I disagree with you, I think it's the stones, right? Um, so a statement is the sort of thing that could be true or false, right? That you could, in principle, agree or disagree with, right? Whereas something like, ouch, it's not even true or false, it's not that sort of thing. Okay, so we're only dealing with statements in arguments. Now, among statements, there are different types. There are atomic and compound, right? Uh, so let's define atomic and compound statements. So here's a compound statement. Here's two, in fact. Ayub is sick and Alice is at work. Compound statement number one. Here's another compound statement for good measure. The fish will bite or we will go home. So why are those compound? What's so special about those statements? What makes them compound statements is that they are made up of parts that are also statements, right? So our first one, Ayub is sick and Alice is at work. One part of that statement is Ayub is sick. That on its own is a statement, right? It could be true or false that Ayub is sick, right? That same number one has another part that is also a statement on its own. Alice is at work, right? That could be true, that could be false. So number one is a compound statement that has as parts two other statements. Right. Um, same with the fish will bite or we will go home. So that's a statement, but it has parts that are also statements. One part is the fish will bite. Another part is we will go home. Now, <clears throat> number three has parts, right? Ayub is sick. Sick is part of that statement, but sick on its own is not itself a statement, right? Sick is just a word. Same with Ayub. Well, on its own, right? That's not a statement. So the key difference between compound statements and atomic statements, again, compound statements have parts that are themselves statements. Atomic statements don't have any parts that are statements on their own. So again, right? Ayub is sick. Sure, it has parts, right? Ayub is, is sick, but none of those are statements on their own, right? Same with Alice is at work, the fish will bite, we will go home, right? So an atomic statement is sort of the smallest unit that can carry a truth value, right? Ayub is sick, that kind of thing is about as small as you can get and still have it be a statement, have it be true or false. You could break it down smaller than that, but what you're left with is not gonna have a truth value. Now, once we've broken up one and two, you may notice that there's some words left over. Uh, specifically, what's left over from sentence one, after we take out the atomic statements, Ayub is sick, right? Alice is at work, we have an and left over. With the second one, the fish will bite or we will go home. If you pull out the atomic statements, the fish will bite, pull out, we will go home, you've got or left over. So and and or are logical connectives or statement operators, right? These are the key, some of the key terms in the English language uh, that are, that let us know the logic of the statement we're dealing with. They're gonna be crucial for determining the inferential relationships between statements, right? 
and we have to use them, we have to zoom in on those to figure out if arguments are valid. So, for example, right, or and and, tiny little words make a huge difference in a statement, right? Suppose, take the statement, you can have soup or you can have salad, right? That means you get one of them, not necessarily both, right? If you say you can have soup and you can have salad, that means you get both, you're guaranteed, right? So which restaurant would you rather go to? Definitely one that says you can have soup and salad, right? Um, you get more for your money. So and says, here's two things that are true, right? Or says, at least one of these things is true, right? So very different functions in English and very different logical implications. So, <clears throat> The technique we're going to build to for testing arguments for validity doesn't really depend on the meanings of the atomic statements, right? Um, whether an argument is valid, right, it's not actually going to matter so much whether I'm saying Ayub is sick, Alice is at work, or whatever, right? It's really going to depend on the statement operators, the ands and the ors and stuff like that. So we can kind of abstract away from the meanings of the atomic statements so that we can zoom in on the statement operators. And we'll do this by taking each atomic statement and replacing it with just a single capital English letter, A to Z, right? Um, which letter you assign to which statement doesn't matter so long as you don't, they don't get repetitive, right? So if my two atomic statements are Ayub is sick and Alice is at work, I don't want to assign A to both of those because then I'll get confused between them. But I could call Ayub is sick S and Alice is at work W. Right? I could call them anything, I E and C, D and F, whatever I like, right? But each atomic statement is gonna get replaced with just a single capital letter. So let's do it. I, I have Ayub is sick and Alice is at work. That's my compound statement. I'm gonna take one of the uh, atomic statements, Ayub is sick, and translate it as A. I'm gonna take Alice is at work, the other atomic statement, and translate it as W, right? Notice I can't use A again, I've already used A. So that translates as A and W. The fish will bite or we will go home. Let's take one of the atomic statements, the fish will bite, we'll call that F. We'll take the other atomic statement, we will go home, call that W, right? Um, notice we got a different statement, right? If it's in a different argument, we can reuse W, right? It's not that once you've used a letter, you can never use it again, right? You just need to keep them straight. You know, if you're dealing with the same argument, definitely have different letters for different atomic statements. So the fish will bite or we will go home, we'll end up F or W. So and and or statements are two kinds of compound statements you can have and the kinds we'll use in arguments, but they're not the only ones. Um, we're gonna cover, well, yeah, we're gonna cover five. Um, types, right? Five statement operators. So and and or are two of them, right? Again, and says, here's two true things, right? Or says, at least one of these is true. Here's some other uh, statement operators. If you pass the exams, then you will pass the course. There, if then, that is a logic word, right? Notice the atomic statement in there, you pass the exams. The other atomic statement, you will pass the course. And the if, right, joins them together. And if then statements have a particular logic as well that we'll get into. I didn't see you yesterday. Here, right, the operator is not, I did not see you yesterday. The atomic statement would be, I did see you yesterday, and the logic word is not, the statement operator is not, right? Number three, you will graduate if and only if you have a GPA of 2.0 or greater. Here, the operator is if and only if, right? Um, the atomic statements are, you will graduate, you have a GPA of 2.0 or greater, right? So we call statements like number one conditionals, right? It makes the truth of one atomic statement conditional on the truth of another, right? <clears throat> passing the course depends on you passing the exams, right? It's conditional on you passing the exams in statement one. Statement two is a negation, right? So it takes an atomic statement like I saw you yesterday and it sort of reverses its truth value. Right? If I saw you yesterday happens to be false, the negation of it will be true. If I saw you yesterday happens to be true, by negating it, we make it false. Number three is a biconditional, right? And it makes the truth of two atomic statements conditional on each other, right? 
Um, so number three says, yeah, the only way you graduate is if you get a GPA of 2.0. And the only way you have a GPA of 2.0 means you graduated, right? In that statement. Um, granted, number three might not be the case, right? I could imagine having a GPA of, of 2.0 and maybe not um, finishing one of my requirements or, or whatever. Uh, so take number three with a grain of salt. But the point is, uh, the idea we'll have some better examples, right? You are a bachelor if and only if you are an unmarried male, right? So being an unmarried male guarantees you're a bachelor. Being a bachelor guarantees you're an unmarried male, right? That's how biconditional work. So we're going to cover each one of these in some detail. I'm just introducing them all now. Five statement operators that you need to learn. So, um, and statements also have a special word. Notice each of these kind of has a special word for it, right? So the if thens are called conditionals. The nots are called negations. The if and only ifs are called biconditionals. And statements are called conjunctions. And or statements are called disjunctions. All right, let's look at and in more detail. So again, and is a statement operator. We call it conjunction and we're, in the text, it's symbolized as a dot, right? Um, so, for example, Ayub is sick and Alice is at work. If we take one atomic statement, Ayub is sick, and symbolize that as A. We take the other atomic statement, Alice is at work, symbolize that as W, and then we can translate the and as a dot, and we end up with A dot W, right? So that is Ayub is sick and Alice is at work, translated into logic language, right? Um, Dot is not the only symbol that you'll see used for and. So um, I will often use the little ampersand thing because it's easier to use in Word and, and a lot of logic texts will use the ampersand. Other ones will use the little upside down V or the caret. So I'm just going to introduce you to all those symbols so that, you know, it'll be a waste to learn all this stuff in this class and then get thrown for a loop because you encounter, uh, you know, something logic-y later that uses the ampersand instead. So, um, on exams, I'll probably be using the ampersand, but also the dot is in the text, right? And you might also see the caret, the upside down B, right? All those mean and. So um, here with Ayub is sick and Alice is at work, we have two atomic statements joined together by a conjunction into a compound statement, right? So we call each of the atomic statements a conjunct, right? So A, Ayub is sick, is the sorry I'm uh, on camera I am uh, switched right so this is my left hand here right so uh, a is the left conjunct and W is the right conjunct right Alice is at work so a conjunction always has two parts a left and a right conjunct conjunctions can also join compound statements together right so I might say Ayub is sick and Alice is at work and June has gone shopping right um, we'll say more on exactly how to symbolize those later as they get more and more co uh, complex, right? Um, but also, conjunction is indicated in English by a bunch of different words. It's not just and, right? But, however, moreover, also, those are also conjunction words in English, right? Now, that might sound a little strange to say and and but mean the same thing, right? Because in English, they have a slightly different valence, right? So if I said, I like you and, you would expect me to, another nice thing to be coming, right? But if I said, I like you, but, you might expect, okay, here comes a criticism, right? But in, but what they do both say is, here's two true things, right? And in logic, that's all we really care about. So, and says, here's two things that are true, but says, here's two things that are true, however says, here's two things that are true. So all of those are conjunctions as far as logic is concerned, right? Because what logic cares about is truth values. So roses are red and violets are blue for our purposes is exactly the same as roses are red, but violets are blue and roses are red. However, violets are blue. All of those would come out R dot V in our notation. Another, so another tricky thing English does is they will sometimes hide the conjunctions, right? So look at this uh, compound statement. Ayub and Alice are both students. Uh, so it has an and in it, right? So we must be dealing with a conjunction, the right, but it's not immediately clear what the two conjuncts are, right? Because to the left of the and, it just says Ayub. Ayub isn't a statement. You have to sort of read between the lines and ask yourself, well, 
what is meant here, right? The left conjunct is Ayub is a student, right? The right conjunct is Alice is a student. So we could, Ayub and Alice are both students means the same as Ayub is a student and Alice is a student, right? But that's a little clunky in English, so we can find ways to sort of join our, our uh, conjunctions together in odd ways. Another way we might do it is with a compound predicate, right? So we might say Ayub is a student and a gentleman, right? And if you're trying to translate it, you might find the and, right? And say, okay, what's the right conjunct? And you'd see a gentleman on its own. That doesn't seem like a atomic statement, right? Well, again, this is just a, you know, condensed way of saying Ayub is a student and Ayub is a gentleman, right? So you have to be on the lookout for the way English gets, you know, a little, I don't know if it's lazy or just more efficient, right? And we tend to hide our conjunctions a little bit and you have to get used to, um, realizing what the two conjuncts actually are, right? If you see and or but, you know you're dealing with a conjunction, sometimes it's a little tricky to find wh which conjunct is which. Let's look at negation for a second. So negation is an operator that takes a statement and reverses its truth value, right? So if I say, I am not the tallest person in the room, the atomic statement would be, I am the tallest person in the room, right? And then the operator is not, so I'd be saying, so if I translated, I am the tallest person in the room as T, then I am not the tallest person in the room would be not T. So the symbol for negation is this little tilde, right, the squiggle. Um, other textbooks use that little sort of shelf symbol there. I'll be mostly using the tilde because it's, again, it's easier to, to type out on the homeworks and exams. So I'll translate not T as tilde T, all right, little squiggle T. As with conjunction, there are multiple ways to indicate negation in English, right? I might say is not, contractions show up a lot, isn't. I could say it is false that, it is not the case that, it is not true that, right? All of these uh, would be translated as the little squill, the not, right? So the difference between not and and, right, is and always has two conjuncts. It's a two place operator, right? Um, Negation is a one-place operator, right? You put not in front of an atomic statement, but it doesn't join two statements together, right? Another sort of, you know, just tricky thing to note, we don't use negation to indicate opposites. So Joe is short is not the um, same as Joe is not tall, right? So if you see two opposite words, don't use not to translate those. Just those are different atomic statements. Joe is short. Joe is, um, sorry, Joe is short is and Joe is tall. Yeah, different atomic statements and um, short is not the negation of tall. It's the opposite. That's a different thing for us. So we only use the negation uh, to translate words like not or false, right? Okay, so we've got two um, statement operators so far, and and not, right? Uh, let's pause for a moment and talk about something we call recursion. So statement operators are recursive, meaning that a compound statement produced by an operator can itself be used in an even more complex compound statement, right? So suppose I've got Ayub is sick and Alice is at work. I could keep adding conjunctions if I like, and I could end up with Ayub is sick and Alice is at work and I am at the store, right? Um, I might negate an entire compound statement. So I might say, it is not true that I am not the tallest person in the room. You might say, well, that's a double negation. And we do tend to avoid those in English class, but the logic is pretty straightforward, right? Not, not, I am the tallest person in the room. Um, I might say, it is not the case that I, you, is sick and Alice is at work and I am at the store, right? So I have a conjunction with another conjunction added to it, and then I negate the whole thing, right? Um, you could think of this phenomenon of recursion sort of in the same way that it, ha it occurs in math, right? So we have operators in math, right? Plus and minus and division and multiplication are operators, right? So, and I can take, you know, a mathematical statement like 2.5, sorry, 2 plus 5, and another mathematical statement like 12 divided by 4, and I could join those together, right, with a plus sign and say, okay, two plus five plus 12 divided by four, right? 
Now you may notice when we get that complicated, it starts to uh, get confusing what is what we call the main operator, right? What, what's the main thing we're doing? Am I adding, am I dividing, what's going on, right? And you may recall in mathematics, right? If you get it wrong, the order of operations, you'll get different answers, right? So like we do in mathematics, we'll use parentheses to reduce ambiguity, right? So if I wanted to say Ayub is sick and Alice is at work, right? And then add with, create a new conjunction, right? By adding another right conjunct, I would write it the way I've written it here, where A and W is in parentheses, and then the new conjunction is there with the S as the right conjunct. So the left conjunct there is itself a conjunction A and W, right? And so on, right? I can keep adding parentheses and uh, I can always make sure what the main operator is. So the main operator is never gonna be in the parentheses. The main operator is always gonna be hanging out there free on its own, right? Um, also, negations don't need parentheses around them, right? Because they're one place operators, so we don't have to worry about ambiguity there. Um, unless you're negating an entire huge uh, compound statement, right? But if, you got, if you're just negating an atomic statement, that doesn't need parentheses, right? General rule of thumb is, uh, if there's ever potential for confusion about what the main operator is, just slap some parentheses and make sure the main operator is the one hanging out on its own, not in parentheses, right? So when we're translating statements, right? It helps to know that every statement has a main operator. Any compound statement has one operator, right? And we say, okay, this statement overall is a conjunction, right? It is an and type statement. Or we say this statement overall is a disjunction, even, it has, even if it has other parts, right, that are different types of statements. So for example, um, not P and not Q is a different statement than negating P and Q, right? Um, the first statement is a conjunction. The main operator is and. The second statement is a negation, right? We see that we put parentheses around the conjunction there. So that tells us that's not the main operator. And the operator that's floating free there is the negation, right? So in the second statement, negation is the main operator. And again, parentheses help us determine what the main operator is. It's the one that's floating free outside the parentheses, right? Um, so, It'll help if we practice with an example, right? Let's take an English statement. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So if you're trying to translate this statement into logic language, uh, you first need to find the main operator. I mean, you could first ask yourself, is this atomic or is this compound, right? It's easy to answer that question by looking to see if you see any logic words. Do you see any ands, any ors, any buts, any nots, any ifs, right? And we do see a but. And we also see a couple knots, right? So we have to ask ourselves, well, which is the main operator, right? Is this overall a conjunction, which buts are conjunctions, or is this overall a negation, right? So uh, there's some hints in English. Uh, a comma is a great hint, right? That sort of breaks a sentence in half and says, here's the two parts. So if you see a comma, and then you see a statement operator next to it, that's a good hint that that's the main operator. And that's the case here, right? I say, I have, you don't have to go home, comma, but, okay, a comma and a but is a good indication that we're dealing with a conjunction. That's the main operator here, right? So um, let's go ahead and translate that. Like, let's turn our, that but into a dot, right? Symbolize it. So that's our first step. We've started translating the statement. Now we have, you don't have to go home as the left conjunct, dot as the operator, right? the conjunction, and you can't stay here as the right conjunct. So now you have to see if you need to break down either part, right? Are, are we done? Are each of the conjuncts atomic statements? If so, then we just assign them sentence letters. Um, but if they're not, if they are also themselves compound, then we need to keep breaking down until we, all we've got left is atomic statements and operators, right? So let's look at the left conjunct. You don't have to go home. Well, there is, an operator in there. There's a not, right? So you don't have to go home is the negation of you have to go home, right? So let's break that down. So we can see there, I did that. I put a negation in front of you have to go home and the rest has stayed the same. Now let's look at the right conjunct, right? Is that atomic? 
well, no, you can't stay here. That's got a not in it too, right? So that needs to be translated away. So I take the not out and replace it with a squiggle, right? And so now I have squiggle, you have to go home, and squiggle, you can stay here, right? You can you can't stay here is the negation of you can stay here, right? So notice I've got three operators there, but I don't need any parentheses yet because we've got a conjunction, that's the main operator, and the other ones are negations. And I said, you typically don't need parentheses for negations unless they're in front of a big compound statement. Um, so let's see, what have we got left? You can stay here and you have to go home. Those are atomic statements, right? Because you can stay here doesn't have any ands, doesn't have any ors, right? Doesn't have any nots, ifs. Same with you have to go home. No ands or ors or anything in there. So we've hit the bottom, right? We've found our atomic statements and we've translated all our logic words into symbols. So now let's pick letters for the atomic statements. Let's call you have to go home G, right? Let's call you can stay here S, right? So now we've finally completely translated our statement. It's not G and not s, right? Squiggle g dot squiggle s. Um, you don't need any parentheses for this one. I'm pretty flexible on quizzes and exams. If people want to be over, do a little overkill with the parentheses, that's that's okay, right? Um, just you know, make sure that it's clear what the main operator is, right? Okay, so we've seen a couple operators, right? We've done a deeper dive into conjunction and into negation, and then we've shown how to start with a statement, write a compound statement, and translate it completely into logic language. Let's look at the other operators, right? Um, there's only three more. So disjunction is expressed in English by the words or, either or, sometimes unless, right? So there's only one symbol for disjunction, right? So remember for and, you might see it as a dot sometimes, sometimes it would be an ampersand, other times the little carrot, the upside down B. This junction is always the little V, the wedge, right? Um, so Freya will pick up her toys or mom will be mad. Well, uh, that statement is a disjunction, right? The main operator is or, right? And just like we had left and right conjuncts with conjunctions, with this junction we have left and right disjuncts. So Freya will pick up her toys or mom will be mad. The left disjunct is Freya will pick up her toys. The right disjunct is mom will be mad. Now each of those is atomic, right? Freya will pick up her toys. It doesn't have any other logic words in it. It doesn't have any nots or ands. So we can just translate that as F. Mom will be mad. Likewise, it's atomic, right? It doesn't have any uh, parts that are also statements. So we can translate mom will be mad as M. And we have translated Freya will pick up her toys or mom will be mad as F wedge m right try another one either you stop talking or i'm going home s or g right so here the either notice was at the beginning and the or is in the middle both the either and the or go away and get replaced by the wedge right so you don't translate the either as a wedge and then the or is the second wedge right because either or still says there's only one disjunction going on here right it's just a another way we flag disjunctions in english right so the way I would translate either you stop talking or I'm going home would be you stop talking, right, is an atomic statement. That's the left disjunct. I'll translate it as capital S or would be the wedge. And then I'm going home, another atomic statement, and I'll translate that's the right disjunct. I'll translate that as capital G, right? So like conjunction, disjunction is a two place operator. Anytime you see an or, you should be looking for a left disjunct and a right disjunct. Um, and, you know, we can use disjunction to combine other compound statements, right? So either both Hannah and IU will come over or we won't play the game, right? Well, uh, you'd have to look at that and figure out, okay, first of all, what's the main operator? We didn't have a comma to help us out, right? But we did have an either or. And the either and the or kind of break up the statement into two, if you notice, right? The either says, here comes a disjunction. And then the or says, here's where it breaks in half, right? So the left disjunct is both Hannah and IU will come over. So that means our left disjunct is itself a conjunction, right? So look down there. Hannah will come over. IU will come over, right? That's the conjunction over there on the left. And then the right disjunct, right? So again, our 
whole statement is either both Hannah and Ayub will come over or we won't play the game. The main operator is disjunction. The right disjunct is we won't play the game. That's a negation, right? It's the negation of we will play the game. So we can translate we will play the game as G and put a disjunction over it. So the, that whole statement translated would be in parentheses H and A or not G, right? So here the left disjunct is H and A and the right disjunct is not G. Our fourth uh, statement operator is conditional, right? So if then statements are called conditionals, right? Now with conjunction and disjunction, you might've noticed uh, it doesn't really so matter so much what order you put them in, right? So um, I'll have soup and salad, right? Same as I'll have salad and soup, right? The order doesn't really matter. It just says, here's two true things. Same with or, I'll have soup or salad, it just means one of these things is true, but it doesn't really what matter what order you put them in. Conditionals, the order matters a lot, right? And so we have a special name for the first part of the conditional and a special name for the second part, right? So, for example, if you have a million dollars, you can buy a cup of coffee. That's pretty, that's obviously true, right? And notice it's a very different statement than if you can buy a cup of coffee, you have a million dollars, right? Um, many of us can buy a cup of coffee. It certainly doesn't mean we have a million dollars. So the order matters a lot for conditionals, right? And to make things worse, in English, we don't always put the if at the beginning, right? We might say something like this. You can have some candy if you clean your room, right? Um, so conditionals are particularly tricky sometimes to translate, right? So the symbol for conditional is the horseshoe or sometimes the arrow, right? I might put the arrow in uh, the homework and in, in the quizzes, right? Because again, it's a little easier to type into a uh, word. I want you to be familiar with both so that when you leave this class, again, if you run into somebody who's using the arrow, you don't get confused and think you never learned it. You're learning the 99% of it right now, so why not give you the extra 1% and say there's two ways to symbolize conditional, the horseshoe and the arrow, right? So uh, suppose you get a statement like, if we get out of class early, we can go to the movies. So here we've got a nice comma, right? That helps us break the sentence into two. And we also get an if at the beginning that tells us this is probably a conditional, right? So it looks like the left part of the conditional, which we call the antecedent, is you get out of class early. So we can translate that as E. And it looks like the consequent or the right side of the conditional is we can go to the movies. So we'll translate that as M right and we put the horseshoe in between them so e horseshoe m right here's a different statement right where again in english we might jumble them around so if i say you can have some candy if you clean your room we don't have a comma right that breaks it up but we do have an if that breaks it in half if always tells us here comes the antecedent right so even if it's at the end of the statement if we if we see an if we know the antecedent is coming next so when i'm translating this I'm going to put you clean your room and I'm going to flip it over to the left side, right? Because it's got the if in front of it. And then I'm going to put you can have some candy on the right, right? Which hopefully should make sense, right? What it's saying is if you clean your room, you get candy, right? That's the sort of causal error, right? Cleaning your room causes candy, right? So in English, we'll jumble stuff all different ways around. In our logic language, we need to make it clear the antecedent is on the left consequent is on the right. And so you might have to rearrange the English to make the logic clear. So again, repeating for clarity, right? The part before the horseshoe or before the arrow, the part that comes after if is called the antecedent. The rest of it is going to be the consequent, right? The part that comes after the horseshoe. Sometimes you get and, sometimes you get then in English, and that's great. That tells you here comes the consequent but they don't always give you then in, in an English sentence, right? And again, we might scramble them all around uh, in everyday English, but if you can find the if, you know, here's the antecedent, put that before the horseshoe. And if you can find the then, you say, oh, that tells us here comes the consequent, and you put that after the horseshoe when you're translating, right? So if you get out early, then we'll go to the movies. If you get out early, we will go to the movies. We will go to the movies if you get out early. Those would all be translated exactly the same way right? They would all be 
E horseshoe M or E arrow M. Now an extra wrinkle when it comes to conditionals is we have another word in English called only if. Now this also says here comes a conditional, right? But only if is, is totally different than if, right? So treat only if and if is completely different words, right? And treat only if is like a, a, a single word kind of jammed together. Because only if says here comes the consequent, right? So you will pass the class only if you take the exams. You would translate that as P then E, right? So the exam part is the consequent, right? So only if says here comes the consequent. If on its own says here comes the antecedent, right? So it, ugh, a little confusing, right? But that's just the English language is confusing. We're trying to regiment it, right? And make it very clear in logic. Okay, so only if picks out what we call a necessary condition, if picks out a sufficient condition, right? So um, if I slam my head against the wall, I will get a headache, right? So slamming my head against the wall is a sufficient condition for getting a headache, but it's not a necessary condition for getting a headache. There's lots of ways to get a headache, right? I could drink a full pint of whiskey, that'll give me a headache too, right? So that's a sufficient condition, the antecedent of a conditional says here is a sufficient condition for some consequence, right? The consequent is a necessary condition. So you could say something like, if you are president, you were born in the United States, right? So being born in the United States is a necessary condition for being president, right? So if picks out the antecedent, it's a necessary condition, it goes before the horseshoe. Then or only if picks out a necessary condition, that's the consequent, it comes after the horseshoe. All right, our fifth and final statement operator, if and only if, right? They call it biconditional. So it's essentially two conditionals stacked together, right? It's, it's the same two atomic statements with the arrow pointing one way and then the arrow pointing the other way, right? Um, so you are a bachelor if and only if you are an unmarried male. This is equivalent to two different conditionals combined together. If you're a bachelor, you're an unmarried male. And if you're an unmarried male, you're a bachelor, right? So you would symbolize that as a arrow pointing both ways, right? So B would be you are a bachelor. U, you are an unmarried male. So B, if and only if U would be translated B, double arrow U. Another word in English that picks out by conditionals is just in case. So this is a lot of information to dump on you, I realize. The whole next lecture is gonna be devoted to practicing this and taking sentences, translating them into our logic language. So watch this a couple of times, review the lecture slides if you need to, right? But try to get those five statement operators in your head, right? And, or, if, then, not, if and only if, right? Conjunction, disjunction, conditional, negation, biconditional. It's only five things to remember, right? They're all concepts that you are very familiar with because you're all English speakers, right? So it shouldn't be too tricky, but you do have to take a little time, make yourself some flashcards, review the lecture slides, get it in your head. Because if you don't get it in your head, the rest of the class, the next, these next few weeks are gonna be kind of a disaster for you, right? The, the mistake I see students make sometimes is they kind of bl blow through this and think, okay, I think I get it but they don't get it memorized, right? So the next time I say conjunction, the word kind of like, they're like, I don't remember what that word means. You gotta remember what that word means or you're gonna be lost for the rest of the class, right? This is just how logic works. These five operators are crucial. So get them in your head. Um, so here's a little more practice, right? You can afford that car only if you get another job or you rob a bank, right? So what's the main operator here? This one's a tricky one. I see only if and I see or, which is the main, operator, right? There's no comma to tell me. You sometimes have to use common sense and context, right? This is saying you can afford the car, right? Only if some other condition is satisfied, right? So only if is the main operator here. This is a conditional, but it's not an if, it's an only if, right? So you can afford that car is the antecedent. You get another job or you rob the bank is a is the consequent, right? And notice this consequent is itself a disjunction. So you would have to break it down further and put it in parentheses, right? 
So you can practice these other guys a bit. If you don't hear from me, and if my car isn't in the driveway, call the cops. Here you have a conditional stacked within a conditional. You know, try to translate that yourself, and uh, we can talk about it in the in the next um, lecture if you like. Tonight and tomorrow night will eat out if and only if I get paid. Here we've got a biconditional as the main operator, right? Um, and the left biconditional is a conjunction, right? Tonight and tomorrow night will eat out. I get paid is the right biconditional. So uh, we'll have more practice on this. There's homework on it. There's going to be a whole other lecture where we practice translating. So try to walk away from this knowing your operators, right? And knowing what they mean. And I'll see you again soon.